Welcome to the A Minute to Midnight show, folks. And um, as always, when I have Lynette Zhang on the show, I look forward to it. I know I learn an awful lot because Lynette has knowledge on these types of financial things. It's miles beyond mine. And I always end up coming away with some good stuff. So it's very interesting times and I think it's great timing to have you on. So thank you for being on the show again today, Lynette. Well, you know, it's always fun to be here, Tony. And, you know, I'm really honored that you would say that because I really always do try and bring value to the table with every conversation. So I'm honored that you feel that way. Yeah, and I always do, you know, really feel that I learn a lot from you. And I watched your update yesterday, um, your ITM update. And again, I learned... Yeah, I learn learn stuff out of it. So, okay, now before I get to um, asking you some questions, I, I'm just going to, I said to you offline, I'm just going to pour some of my thoughts out quickly. Um, uh, probably people may not agree with it. You may not agree with it, but I feel like I've got to say it. So um, I'll, I'll just start off with that and then I'll throw it to you. Okay, so before he was elected in 2016, well before, I expected an economic crash will happen under Trump. Okay, so I wrote articles on it and said things about it on the show um, in 2016 and and that, that that was before the elections. Before Some of it was even before he was the chosen candidate. Um, but I always wondered how it could happen without Trump having to take the blame for an economic crash because if he's a puppet actor for the Illuminists, and I personally think he is... Uh, he'd not want to appear to be the fall guy. That wouldn't look good for him. So I've wondered how it could work. Well, perhaps the coronavirus could be the way for that to happen. He can't really be blamed for the economy crashing as a result of the virus, and he could even be a hero to everyone to help people ride through it. In fact, people could even embrace martial law and other desperate emergency measures because they, a lot of people trust Trump. Obviously, some people don't like him at all, but a lot do. So I'm not sure how it will play out, but it's increasingly looking to be a possibility to me. I know some of you won't, won't like what I've just said, but remember Trump too has also been a strong advocate for 5G and for vax um, eans all the way, and people may need to ask themselves why. And could it be that 5G has actually weakened the immune systems of the people in Wuhan to such a degree that their bodies can't fight it so well? And that's why so many have been dying in Wuhan. Being that 5G was switched on only a few weeks before the outbreak in Wuhan. Um, And as far as people dropping dead on videos go, we've actually got no idea what killed them. It could be a heart attack, totally unrelated Um, Some of those CCTV footage things, you know, you see people dropping dead and everyone's panicking. But we don't really know what caused them to drop dead. Maybe nothing to do with the coronavirus or 5G for all that matter. Who knows? Okay, so, so far outside China, the death rate that those that catch it has been quite low. However, if it becomes a global pandemic, and even if it only kills 2% of those that catch it, that could still be millions of people. But the other thing is, how will this affect the global economy? That may be worse than the virus itself. So if the global economy starts to seriously crash as a result of the coronavirus, no one will be able to blame Trump for it. And especially if a global pandemic uh, ensues, he can't really be vilified for the crash, and neither can the banksters. He could emerge as a strong leader, uh, you know, ahead of unprecedented emergency measures that desperate people may embrace, no matter if they're good or bad measures. But the banksters may be able to continue to hide in the shadows and take absolutely no blame for the crash, which really they will have engineered. So those are my thoughts. You may have totally total disagreement with them. (laughs) I don't know. But a lot's happening. So we're seeing... The stock market crashed big time yesterday, and as of now, it's, well, I looked just before this, and it was down 900 points on the Dow again um, before the close, so that's, you know, pretty substantial. But the real interesting thing is the gold and silver prices are being knocked uh, at the same time the last two days. Is this a desperate measure to stop them from running away? 
I would absolutely say so because a rising gold price is an indication of a failing currency. And we're seeing a flight to safety. I mean, if the money is coming out of the stock market, it has to go someplace. So where is it going? Well, it's going into treasury bonds, government bonds. And the interesting part about that is the problem is too much debt. So, you know, we, we're definitely seeing both the 10-year and the 30-year in the U.S. at the lowest interest rates historically ever. We've seen a yield curve inversion in both the two-year and the five-year. But for those that ignore the two-year and the five-year, don't worry, because I looked this morning before I came into the office, and we have the three-month yield higher than the 10-year yield. And that is the one that, according to the Federal Reserve, is the biggest predictor of recession, except we're not really entering a recession. And considering the fact that China is the second largest economy and 90% of their corporations reportedly are being impacted by the coronavirus. And we are, you know, I mean, look, we were in globalization and now we're in deglobalization, but we're not completely deglobalized yet. So they, Dun & Bradstreet anticipates that what's happening in China will have an impact on at least 5 million companies globally. So for normal everyday people that have not yet been impacted by the coronavirus, that means that your standard, your current standard of living is at risk. For example, in Italy, well, you go into the grocery store and the grocery store shelves are bare. So if you're just going along and thinking everything is normal, most people have enough food in their house for three days. The grocery stores have enough food on their shelves for three days. Maybe they have a, wear, a, a warehouse where there's another three days worth of food. But when people panic, you know, I mean, I have my mantra, food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. But these are things that we need no matter what's happening in the economy. This is our standard of living. So for people that haven't really made the choice or have been sitting on the fence, I'm looking at this as a huge wake-up call. And with gold and silver, which is so easy to manipulate the spot price. But look, I've got physical right here. Yeah, and what, you know, I don't worry about whether this moves up or down today or tomorrow in a trade. If it gets cheaper, you buy it because you really always want to have the lion's share of your wealth in an undervalued asset that's in a long-term positive trend and that's true for both gold and silver what you're looking at with these markets severely overvalued and yesterday was the third largest drop in the dow in its history and remember i was there on black monday in 1987 so i know what that looks like and tastes like and feels like and I can tell you, the stocks, even after that 900-point drop, if it drops another, or was 1,000 yesterday, 1,031, I think, if it drops another 1,000 points today, stocks are still severely overvalued because they're talking about forward earnings. And what's happening with the coronavirus in China, business is essentially stopped. It's just stopped. So all of those consumers and the people that stay home that don't go into work, therefore they're not getting their paycheck, therefore they're not going out and shopping. I mean, this definitely could be big enough to topple the house of cards that we and the illusion that we have been living in, and not since 2016, but since 2008. Because frankly, that was really when the system died. It died. And then all the central bankers have done has been to print money to cover up the problem. And we all know that that can work for a while. 
I mean, you know, if, if you're looking at an individual level and if I get into trouble and I have savings so I can pull from my savings and I can take care of that trouble or cover it up so it doesn't really impact me, that's fine. The problem that we face now is that that's been ongoing for a decade and they just, and they're, they're a lot of the world, what we've got 17 trillion in negative yielding debt and we've got the 10 year note and the 30 year note selling yielding less than the inflation target of the central bank. So it's less than 2%. I mean, we've been in Alice in Wonderland and what I've said right along, and I know that, that the coronavirus is controversial, you know, was it a leak germ or blah, 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 but whether it was or how it got here or what have you, the bottom line is, is, is as long as it was, cheap enough or who is going to be most greatly impacted, the central bankers just keep printing money. And that money goes to the elites that goes to, you know, the corporate insiders, the people that are high up on the echelon, not to you and me. So when it gets too expensive, that's when those music, that's when the music stops. And this could definitely be an excuse for the music to stop. And, and in my mind, quite honestly, before this happened, you know, it, I saw all the technical signs of a melt up, which looks great, right? Because everybody loves it when the stock market or the gold price or whatever Wall Street manipulations make it look like it's going straight up. But you have all those algorithms. You have, you know, they're not so much human where you can stop with a thought process. Everything is now basically based on computer momentum trades and considering when you take that into consideration, that's a big problem. And, and, you know, we started the, I anticipated a dead cat bounce today. Now it started out to give us a little bit of bounce before the markets opened, but after the markets opened, it quickly lost that momentum. They couldn't make it happen. So, you know, this, this is really not good. I don't know if, if those that are in the markets have fully lost their opportunity to get out because it isn't just about the prices falling for me. My concern is their ability to liquidate at any price. Yeah, that's a good point. And you mentioned uh, things like food and water and all shelter and barterability and all that. And I mean, that's been really big in my mind lately. I've been trying to sort of tell people that one way or another through videos and different things of, you know, do it in a way to not make people terrified, but just do it. Have some fun doing it or whatever, but just do it. You know, you don't want to be caught. And, exactly. um, and, and I've been feeling that big time. But Certainly interesting to watch the last two days when gold has particularly been rising up until the last two days and silver as well. And then bam, the stock market gets whacked and so do the prices of the precious metals. So people are probably going, how does that work? Oof. Well, you know, the COMEX has all these contracts. In fact, I'm going to do something. This is, this is a piece I've been like dying to do, but I think it's now risen and, I'm, and I've been accumulating data for it. But, you know, in these markets, there are more derivatives being traded than actually stocks. So on the CME, which is just a corporation that issues these contracts, futures contracts, et cetera, um, you can go in and you can control 500 ounces of gold or 5,000 ounces of silver for $150. If you are a central bank, it only costs you $110. Okay. Well, let's see, you know, that it's so much cheaper to just manipulate the price with those contracts, with the futures contracts, than it would be if you were buying and selling the physical. So, you know, what, what's it take? And if you're a central bank, you don't even have to go out and earn the money to buy those contracts. You just push a button and create it. So that's how that happens. And in 2008, we saw the spot market drop 32%, but 
having said that, and I need to find this out, Eric will be back tomorrow and, and we're doing a Q&A, so he'll, he'll have a chance to talk to the wholesalers. But what I can tell you for sure, in 2008, that as the spot market was dropping 32%, the premiums on what people had to pay for the physical metals were also exploding. And what normally takes a within 48 hour delivery was taking up to three months for delivery. So, you know how it happens? Well, it's just a, a derivative contract. It's just a bet, which is super cheap and no big deal to sell as much gold or as much silver as you want to because it costs you a fraction of the physical. And that's how they do it. And they do it because they don't want you to protect yourself with physical gold and silver. I mean, I guess if you're going to do the ETFs, the GLDs or something like that, that's okay because that's not real physical gold or silver and it's not outside of the system. But remember, they want you to volunteer the wealth that you hold in the system because it's not legally really yours anyway. You just don't realize it. And if you choose to hold your wealth there and it goes away, who are you going to call? Who are you going to complain to? Yeah, true. Well, yeah, in terms of um, in New Zealand with the gold price, um, as of yesterday, um, but this would be actually the day before, but it was in yesterday's news, um, gold, oh, well, brisk gold trade with traders in New Zealand, gold hits all-time high. In New Zealand, the price. Gold traders reported hectic buying and selling on Monday as coronavirus fears pushed the New Zealand gold price to a record high. So actually, right, you know, two days ago anyway, we were at the highest gold has ever been in New Zealand. So yeah, that's, that's higher than even the last financial crisis. See, and that, and I think that that's true. Um, that's actually true in many countries. In the U.S., We've been forming a cup, so spot gold bottomed in 2016, and it has been rising ever since. I mean, there's nothing goes straight up, nothing goes straight down. You know, you always have to bounce along the way, but, you know, there is no resistance, upper resistance level until you hit 1,800, and then there's nothing until you hit 1,900, and then beyond that, it will be new all-time highs. But but here's the thing, okay? If we look at that and we look at, you know, gold making new highs in New Zealand and other parts of the world, you're still looking at the value that the markets want you to see, that the manipulators want you to see. None of that reflects its fundamental value, its true value for its most important function. What the function that it has performed for 6,000 years, which is as really a wealth, <clears throat> excuse me, a wealth insurance policy. And the reason why I say that is when you look back, the way that they revalue a currency is against gold. Gold is the primary currency metal, silver is the secondary currency metal. So when they actually do an official reset, I mean, they can, they can suppress the price of gold as, as long as they want through those cheap contracts. It's not like they actually have to own the gold. However, when they are ready, then they do that revaluation and that happens slowly and then bam overnight and they reset or revalue gold in terms of the currency wherever you are in the world and that's when you see it begin to move toward its true fundamental value and and you can see it quite clearly in Venezuela, Argentina, you know, those places where it's happening to, right now and today. So, yeah, that, that's the piece. I can tell you if I were just taking into account U.S. government debt and U.S. government gold holdings, 
then the true value of an ounce of gold is somewhere north of $30,000. Now, if you said that to somebody, they think you're insane, except if they were going to do a reset here today to cover all of the debt and the new money that they've printed, that's where it would go in terms of fiat. But when it did that, what that really tells you is nobody has confidence in the currency anymore. They're not going to use the currency anymore. So you better have the gold and you better have the silver to back yourself up and always be able to meet the need, meet your standard of living needs. So what about people now, you know, if people are in panic mode and don't have anything at the moment, where would they start? Well, I would probably start with food and water because you can't live without food and water. So, you know, I would go to the grocery store while there's still ample choices on the shelves and I would make sure that I would buy lots of beans and rice because you put them together and that's a complete protein um, you throw in a can of tomatoes and it's pretty tasty. So I would start with food that's easy to store and make sure that you have enough so that when the grocery store shelves go barren, you do not go hungry. Yep, I totally agree. And hopefully people are mostly that listen to us, have, and well, we've harped on about this for a long time, hopefully the people that are listening mostly already will have, but there will no doubt be some that have done nothing. So it's like, okay, the window of opportunity is probably closing. You want to get in. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's going to be really interesting because this is so much different than 2008. And 2008, frankly, was really just a warning. But the central banks have used up all their ammunition. And I've been finding it really interesting how frequently a central banker will admit that they are out of ammo because that's the interest rates. And with in the U.S., you know, plumbing new lows, you know, how low can you go? Well, they've been testing that and they've been finding that, you know, because that interest rate is about stimulating people to want to borrow, take on debt and spend money. And that hasn't been working the way they thought it would work because it was just a big fat experiment. So, I mean, this should be an indication to everybody that we are at the end of the line. You know, I'm not saying that they can't just print us into oblivion. The IMF has called out for coordinated efforts. The G20 has called out for coordinated efforts. They're going to coordinate their efforts, but but what can they do? Print more money? And, and where will that money go? Into the stock market? But then when they do the reset, like we saw in Venezuela, was the best performing stock market in the world because of the hyperinflation. And then when they lopped off the zeros, Guess what happened in the stock market? All those zeros got lopped off too, and it was a straight down. In fact, um, will you make sure we'll send you the chart so you can see what I'm talking about? That just happened in 2018. Okay, so mark that down. We'll get you that Excellent. so you can see it. So people, you know, and then they're talking, well, wow, we've only given up a little bit. We're only four and a half. Well, we might be about 9% away from the recent all-time highs, but it's still overvalued. But what, what I can see happening is because all the news is doom and gloom now because of the coronavirus, so in a, in a sense that this will take away the focus of the bankers um, when yep. the crash comes. It's like they can blame something else. Exactly. Um, and that, yeah. But it's very interesting. I mean, there's been some interesting articles coming out in New Zealand on various aspects the last two days uh, of different things. Um, for instance, our finance minister, Grant Robertson, who appeared beside our prime minister the other day, two days ago, I think it was, um, said that, you know, they have an, adv an economic advisory group looking into the potential impacts of the coronavirus on the New Zealand economy. It's already knocking the tourist industry because that's big here. See, Air oh, yeah. New Zealand, our main airline, is talking about losses 
um, and so on. But the finance ministers said that they're looking at three scenarios. One, see a drop in New Zealand exports for the first half of 2020 and back to normal in the second half, or a longer-lasting domestic economy shock or a global recession. And then they're saying, you know, oh, we don't know which one of those three things it's going to be, but n- none of them look good, even the exactly. most r- mildest of those, you know. Exactly, and it, it's 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 way bigger. If you've got, I mean, we've got globalization where everybody came together and everybody's really dependent on China. You know, so if 90% of their corporations are impacted negatively by coronavirus and they're not shipping, and you also mentioned, you know, mentioned tourism, well, we were just having a conversation on, you know, we've got our vacation set. Uh, do we really want to go on these vacations? Because that's a luxury. That's not a necessity. Do you really want to do that? I don't know. And that's what's happening for a lot of people that are thinking about travelling. Yes. Well, also on the 25th, um, the Reserve Bank Governor of New Zealand, uh, Adrian Orr, he, he, it's interesting, he's come out and said a, a couple of things. One thing he's said is, don't try and predict, just think about preparation for, from your business side. I know we're doing this at the Reserve Bank, he said. But then it's interesting, he's also, I noticed right down the end of this thing is, Banks can do a negative number if it was a small negative interest rate. Now all of this is preparation. It's not a prediction. In other words, he's saying we could go to very low or already as if they are already low enough or negative interest rates in New Zealand. That's our central bank, you know, the head of our central yeah. bank. So that's like, hmm, okay, you know, it's, it's not sending a good <laughs> message. Uh, no. No, and I mean, we were in trouble. The globe was in trouble before the coronavirus even came to yeah. anybody's consciousness. So, you know, I mean, I, look, I'm not a scientist. I don't work in a lab. I'm mm-hmm. not even very medical, as my children can attest. <laughs> but what I can tell you is I'm very financial. And you're so right about that deflection piece I can't tell you if this really just was a happenstance or if there was something that was leaked. But what I can tell you is that central bankers, according to their own documents, like as much distance between their policy and how they get that policy to you or me as possible so that we do not understand that that's where it came from to begin with. And a pandemic like this um, really does take the onus off the central bankers and off the off all the bankers and even off the governments because now they can say, well, we're fighting this. I, I don't really know what it is. I, I can't, I, I don't even really have an opinion on whether or not it happened on its own yeah. or there was some, some engineering that created the outbreak, but it doesn't matter because frankly, the outcome is going to be the same. Yeah. And I don't even know that we're getting really all of the honest answers on what's really happening as far as the numbers are concerned, because they keep changing the criteria of how you're going to count this. And now the incubation period has gone from what they anticipated being 14 days to when I did some research over the weekend, it was 27 days. And then some of the guys in here said it's now 28 days. So you're not even showing symptoms for almost a month well, if that really, if if all of that is true, you can see how that can spread pretty quickly, and you can also see how they can justify the reset of the currency, quantitative easing into affinity, everything crashing, and now we got to start all over again. Now they're justifying it. It was interesting in China because, yeah, I don't trust anything that's coming out of China in terms of accuracy. No way. I mean, that, I think way more people have died than what they're ever going to tell you. But um, Absolutely. Yeah. The, the other thing, though, is the fact that they were destroying banknotes that could have the virus. I'm yeah. thinking, oh, is that just another, another way for them to move towards cashlessness in, in China? Yeah, except they already pretty much are. The only people there that still use those banknotes are 
old people because they're more comfortable with that. So yeah, that's definitely a justification for destroying even more currency, but they're, they're pretty much digital. And, and that's part of the problem from what I've been reading is there is a level of comfort that the government, the communist party has because they're a full surveillance economy mm -hmm. and a full surveillance society that, you know, some of the locals were um, in government were, didn't want to sound bad or come off bad. So they delayed reporting what was even happening. And so they were really even delayed in trying to even get this under some level of control. So you'd think in a full surveillance economy, they would know it like that, but apparently not. Yes, yeah, well, that's true. Actually, talking about um, cash and cashlessness or whatever, another New Zealand yep. story that came out 24th of February, because we're a day ahead, so that would be now three days ago, um, uh, that was titled, this was in our um, stuff.co.nz business online, and it's titled, The Public Want a Right to Use Cash, says Reserve Bank Governor Adrian Orr. The public sent a clear message to the Reserve Bank that people would not tolerate moves to make New Zealand a cashless society. We're going, uh, sorry, we're certain it's going to be less cash, but not cash less, said Reserve Bank Governor Adrian Orr in a speech the other day. Because uh, the Reserve Bank, um, which is interesting that a central bank would even do this, uh, has asked public, sorry, asked public for feedback on the future of cash, and the response was huge. Said Orr, it really touched the heart and soul of an enormous amount of people. They really wanted the right to have access to and or to use cash. He said, so that's really interesting. Um, you know, I'm I'm glad, <laughs> on in one sense, to to hear that. See, it's working. <laughs> reason why I said that it's working is because you are actually because of the loss of confidence in the central bankers on a global basis a number of them are reaching out uh, there was just a whole piece on this are reaching out to the community to try and reinvent themselves so that they're not seen as the bad guys uh -huh. but yeah. they're seen as the good guys now, maybe your central bankers are good guys. I, I don't, don't think so. I don't. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but they definitely want that perception that they're really trying to do what's right for the for the public and the little guys. Mm. And so personally, and I could certainly be wrong about this, except that I'm seeing this come up again and again now, which means it's a trend. That, uh, that that this is a trend of the central bankers to shed their negative in, image and take on a more positive image so that on the whole other side of this mess, they stay in power. Yep, so then when there is a crash, they can't bl be blamed for it, basically. Exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, I think so. Mm, yeah. Very interesting. So what else do you think is important to know at the moment? Oof. Uh, you know, I mean, as if the markets weren't bad enough and as if, you know, I mean, what I can tell you, so this is a piece I'm going to do for next week, so I'm kind of giving you, you know, a heads up on it, is the way that the stock market structure has changed. Um, and in this country, they're actually talking about tax incentives for the little guy. If you put $10,000 into the market, it's tax free. Right. So you can take pre-tax income and, and buy stock with it. Well, anything that they can get the little guy to buy the severely overvalued market and to keep this game going until it becomes too expensive. And I'm afraid that everything has become too expensive. So that's why if you and I are correct that this is more of a planned event, right? And it yeah. takes the heat off of the governments and off of the central bankers. Then that tells you that the whole system, the whole to keep everything appearing normal or good, it's just gotten too expensive. 
Yes. Okay. So do you see in the near term the prices of precious metals going up much or do you see it staying Oh, yes, much? I do. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no. I, I definitely, 100%, yes, I definitely do think that the spot market will rise. I think in this country, just like in your country, I think we will definitely see new all-time highs. Uh, the, it's questionable because first we have to go into a, I mean, this right now, I would say that this is a hyper deflationary state. Markets imploding are deflationary. So there's only one way to fight deflation, and that's with inflation. So I think we're about to see global QE to infinity, and I think we'll, we'll likely see a global melt up. But at the same time that, that it looks like there's all this liquidity, I think the opposite is actually happening because all of this money printing just doesn't have the same impact that it did when they first started. This is the end of the cycle. So it's like pushing on a string. And while I can see them continuing to manipulate the spot price, you have to understand that at some point it is in their benefit not to manipulate that anymore. So yes, I do see the spot markets breaking new highs on a global basis. Um, however, I still don't think that that will be reflective of their true value. I think that they will remain bargains until the governments are ready for a full economic reset. And that could be, I don't think that will be this year. Um, because I think we have a lot more pain to go through before we will fully just accept it. But we're very close. We're close. And I think by 20, I mean, honestly, I mean, who the hell, oh, pardon me, who knows? <laughs> I know. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> but, you know, we also can't forget what we have coming up next year, which is the end of the LIBOR system. Yes. The interest rate system. And all of those contracts, and they've been trying to shift this um, into a new system, create a new system, create a new market for that system, and transition trillion, something like, I don't know, 6 trillion, 16 trillion, I don't remember the number, 600 trillion, oh no, I think it's 300 trillion of contracts into that new market and new system that they created, and that's never been done. So I don't know, you know, but we're close. And I take this, if I haven't done anything yet, uh, this should be a wake-up call. Okay, so I'm just thinking there will be some people, particularly probably older people, um, that will have put some of their money into physical precious metals, but they've got them sitting in bank vaults. What, what would you tell those people to do? Private vaults are a preference. Um, also, I mean, you need to have them where you can access them easily. So, I mean, I can't do this anymore, obviously, because I'm way too visible. But I hold mine in a private vault that I, I could walk to if I needed to walk to it. I could get there. Uh, but, you know, if they do a... Bank holiday, I'm pretty sure it won't be a holiday for you or me. <laughs> so uh, they should also look for really hidden places in their homes, stairwells. I mean, under steps, that's kind of dead space, bottom of shelves, you know, things like that. Not the typical places like don't hold them in your freezer, don't hold them in your underpants drawer, because that's where... If somebody's coming in, that's where they're going to look for your good stuff. So you you have to be creative with it. I had a client that had a fireplace, and she never used her fireplace. So she removed some bricks right up where she could reach it and around there. And so she would hold it there. I mean, who's going to think to look in a fireplace? So get creative. Make sure that it truly is secure. That's part of the security part that we talk about in my mantra, and you want to have layers of security, but most people don't hold precious metals anymore. 
So I don't really think it's like somebody's going to go, oh, I bet you they have gold and silver, yeah. right? Yeah. But you still just have to be creative with where you put it. Yeah, and uh, w with the bank vault situation in Greece when they had the pro the problems and in Cyprus and they had bank holidays right. and things, people couldn't get in to get their precious metals. So that should really say don't hold them in bank vaults, really, shouldn't it? Oh, absolutely. And I've heard from a few ITM clients that uh, they've gone in and actually opened up their boxes because they had suspicions about I don't know what. And, you know, if you're holding bullion gold, at least in this country, well, you're not actually allowed to hold that in a bank safe deposit box because it's classified as hoarding. But if you have the collectibles here, that is not considered hoarding. That is considered collecting. So that is okay. However, I agree with you 100%. I don't hold mine in a bank vault because if they declare a bank holiday, even if they don't drill into your box, you lose all access to it. And if they do drill into your box, it could be confiscated. Yep. Just saying. Okay, so if, if people are listening and they don't have any precious metals, um, say, and yeah, firstly, they've got to get the food and the water and uh, probably medical supplies and all of those essentials to live sorted out first. But right. where, if somebody has a limited budget and they think, well, I want to put some of it now into something in the precious metals market, what would you suggest they do? Well, it depends on the size of their budget. I can tell you that our minimum is 500 bucks, which could be insurmountable for some, but not for everybody. And silver in this country at like $18, $19 an ounce is something that is probably affordable for many people. I'd also like to point out that both gold and silver in any form is monetary at its base. So if you have Aunt Bessie's sterling silver, you know, uh, salt and pepper shakers, well, those are 92 and a half percent pure. If, if, if they're broken or dinged or tarnished, doesn't matter. Right. So there are a number of different ways that you can accumulate if you have jewelry that's either gold or silver. You know, I mean, 14 karat gold jewelry is 58, roughly 58 percent pure. 18 is 75 percent pure. I don't know what 10 or 12 is, but it's got a level of gold in it that they can recover. So that's still monetary at its base. So it depends on how much you have to work with, but there too, um, depending upon how limited what you know what you have to work with is, there are still ways to accumulate at an affordable level. And I'd also like everybody to keep in mind that anything that is physical is barterable. Even toilet paper is a great tool of barter, frankly. And it goes in very high demand when the grocery store shelves are bare. Any talents that you have are also barterable. The difference between silver and gold and toilet paper and talent is that the silver and gold are universal. Whereas I might not need toilet paper at the moment or I might not need your skill set at the moment. So that's essentially the difference is, is, is the universal ability to use the physical gold and silver. But there's the, anything physical is barterable. I have chickens. I have eggs. That's barterable. Actually, I can even show you some eggs because I brought them in today. This is barterable. People need food. So, you know, I just want everybody to keep it in mind that, uh, you know, e even if you are of limited means, there are ways to accumulate to put yourself in the best position, for sure. Okay, so now what about you personally, your, you know, your line of work, who you work for, your website, your YouTube channel? Do you want to let people know all those details? No. <laughs> 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 ITM trading <laughs> is, is in Phoenix, Arizona. And we are a full service 
physical gold and silver dealer. We only deal with physical. So we like it when people take possession. And really what makes us different than anybody else is I personally have been studying currency since 1989. And it's easy to see the repeatable patterns. And that's what we're living in. That's why you don't really see me freaking out because I was anticipating this because it's a repeatable pattern. And uh, so we, I created a strategy for myself, but we all use the same strategy here. And it's based on those repeatable patterns and making sure that you have enough silver and barterable gold to sustain your current standard of living. And if you're fortunate enough to have extra, this is for growth so that you can take advantage of the opportunities that present during these periods of time because there are opportunities that definitely come up. And we just wanna, if you're in the right place at the right time with the right asset, guess what? You get to take advantage of that. But we also have a YouTube channel. So we are super keen on education. You don't have to agree with me. I give you all the links and make it easy. Uh, but um, yeah, we post there all the time. So you can either put my name in Lynette Zhang or you can go to the ITM trading uh, website, the YouTube channel, the blog, Brighty on. So uh, we're, we work really hard here. Excellent. Okay, so as we look to wrap up, have you got any um, last things that you'd like to get across? Hmm, I don't think so. I think we covered a lot today. Yeah, I think we did too. That was pretty much everything I had in mind. So I want to say thank you again. Um, and no doubt when we next talk, we will have moved even further down the spectrum of yes. you know what's happening. So that will be interesting to communicate again in the near future. So thank you heaps again for um, your input, Lynette. It's been great as always. Oh, it's and it's always a pleasure to be here, Tony. Cheers. Just have to show up at your doorstop after we're over this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I yep. keep threatening. I'm gonna do it one of these <laughs> days. I keep yes. threatening. Sounds good. Folks, don't forget to give this a thumbs up if you're watching it on YouTube and also it'll be on iTunes and on our website, a minute to midnight.com. And also just a reminder to folks that a minute to midnight is run 100% by donations. We don't sell anything or do any advertising or money collecting off YouTube or anything like that. Um, we really appreciate donations. They've been somewhat slow of late, uh, so I really would appreciate donations to keep this running. That'd be awesome if you can help. Thank you to the folks that do help, uh, and if you want to help, you can do that at a minute to midnight.com. And all of our shows are found there on our archives as well, and uh, there are articles on the website as well, which you can read. That's it for this episode of the show. God willing, we'll be back with another episode in a few days time so until then have a great week and god bless